Our guest this evening, we have we have a very special treat for you folks. Our guest this evening is one of my favorite people at Mays. We have spent a fair bit of time together over the last two years. I first heard of you through your husband, whom I do CrossFit with. I remember. And uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know you both over the last couple of years. Dr. Janet Marcantonio, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. We are, we are really looking forward to we're really looking forward to this show. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Me too. You've made me look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> so describe your current professional role here at Mays. I think the audience will want to hear it from you. Yes. So I have been here 11 years. Uh, it has been my pleasure to teach capstone courses in our MBA programs. And then over the last three years to add an individualized leadership development dimension to the program, which takes place outside the classroom. And so I have the pleasure of facilitating that experience for our MBA students. Okay. And how did you, how did you get here? You've, your, your professional road has been winding in many ways. Tell the listeners a little bit about that. So that's a good word. Uh, I came to this quotation later in life. Uh, Peter Drucker famously said that uh, career success is not planned. Uh, you are able to discover opportunities when you understand your strengths and weaknesses and what you value. And that has been very true for me. Uh, I'm an educator at heart. I love teaching and learning. I see those as operating in a cycle, always learning and then teaching and growing. And I have done that really in every professional role. You mentioned uh, a lot of variability there in the classroom, in the nonprofit sector, in consulting, and now here at Mays. So let's dig into that a little bit more. You have obviously a variety of professional experiences, several degrees. Uh, walk us through your story, if you don't mind. So I am over the legal limit of higher education. Uh, I have learner in my top strengths to speak Gallup Strengths Quest. Mm -hmm. The shadow side of that is jack of all trades, master of potentially any one of them. Will you please make a choice? No. <laughs> so I have a big appetite for learning many things, and I also need to keep feeding my interests in learning new things. I think in my 20s, early 30s, that led me to seek diverse experiences, but always to come back to the theme that I love education. I love facilitating someone else's process of self-discovery. Interesting. So among the things that you did, you worked at the Rockefeller Foundation while completing your PhD. Actually, I want to back up a little bit. I want to shift sure. gears for a second. You described learner as being in your you know, in, among your top strengths. So I'm going to segue that. Maybe this is a little ham-fisted, but what is your favorite superpower? How does that, how does that play with, and does it have anything to do with your desire to learn things? So that is a great question. Now that I do so much coaching and appreciation of individual differences. Mm -hmm. I appreciate superpowers a lot in other people. Oh. I think I have learned to try those on in a way that is authentic to me so that I can use them when they are appropriate for the other person or the team or the situation. So you're like Rogue from X-Men. Well, yes. I will admit to not understanding that analogy at this <laughs> moment. But I like hearing it. I'll go look it up. I'll use Learner and I'll go look it up. It's when Rogue like touches someone, it has to make physical contact, I think, but can take on somebody else's superpowers for a certain period of time. Yes. I think discernment might be a good word. I try to tell relevant from irrelevant and read what is necessary to make success, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. So one of the experiences that you and I talked about that was most formative for you was your time in the Peace Corps. A lot of, a lot of interesting things happened during that time. Tell us about some of those. That was an excellent developmental decision for me, being a garden variety 
young person, fairly typical adolescence going through undergraduate, knowing that I needed to add some muscle, some scar tissue, some dimension. And I had been influenced by a couple who were in the first Peace Corps class to go to Malawi back Mm. in 1964. I used to babysit for their kids, and I heard their stories, and I felt inspired by those. It was truly a very unexpected experience. It was living in a rainforest for two years. It was the most underpopulated area of a small country in West Africa, Mm -hmm. Gabon, West Africa. And I lived in a house that was actually a cage for large primates. It was turned into a house for me by pouring concrete around the bars and turning them up. What were the dimensions, if I can ask? Do you you remember? Ever so slightly larger than I am. (laughs) I think they posted me there, perhaps. So they looked at the 40 of us who went into the trainee class in that country and said, she's going there. Right. That, That probably was why. But everything from doing laundry in the river to visiting villages that had no electricity, it was a very pioneering experience. It was also a place where people were still alive. There were people over the age of 40 who had never had contact with a white European or a white North American. Mm -hmm. And that for me was a new world. It helped me understand the larger world and the risks and hardships and vulnerabilities that most of the world's population deals with day in and day out. Mm -hmm. I think it also taught me that people are people wherever you go, and you have to listen and observe, uh, talk less, listen more. That was probably the lesson that I learned from Peace Corps. Paraphrasing Hamilton there. <laughs> um, but uh, so do you think, this, this may seem like an odd question, but do you think that being a slightly smaller person, perhaps not built for professional basketball, uh, <laughs> do you think that made your... Do you think that made your work there easier or harder? So I do come across most of the time as non-threatening. I'm not sure every student in the program would say that, but I think the majority would say that. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are going in to assist people to reach the goals of that country, Mm -hmm. so to develop their own capacity building in education, you need to be non-threatening. You need to discover reality through their eyes. I think small stature helped with that to a large degree. Uh, I'm definitely not built for professional basketball. I do not remember uh, in elementary school ever being anything other than the smallest person in my class. And a few memories. Dodgeball was very unpleasant. I was an easy target to boink early. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm a little athletic, but more for swimming and yoga. Okay. We have a an alum who who used to say, I have the athletic ability of a ketchup packet. Mm-mm. His his name is Mills Mankey. He had communication in his top strengths, so I still remember that. And my stature caused me probably to be afraid more than not. Bullies, I've always disliked bullies. I can overreact to people who are bullying or using power to hurt others. Was you and I have spoken about a previous MBA class where that was an issue. I won't be specific, but do you feel that you could have handled that situation better, but you may have overreacted due to the perception of, I think these are your words, a very powerful personality acting upon the class for the worse. How was your re- how was your reaction to that? Reaction to that. So we've had that situation two or three times during my time here. I think program director, various faculty, my role to one degree or another, also strong students in the class Mm -hmm. who have the well-being of the class as a whole in mind. Mm -hmm. Those are the successful ingredients to pushing back on that force directed by someone who may be a bully. Mm. I'm not the best at taking on a bully head on. I wouldn't try to. 
do that? I think I think dealing with bullies is kind of like Aikido. Like you have to figure out ways to be be water um, to use their force against. That's them. A, that's a good way to think about it and think about what's underneath their behavior. Yes, sometimes they're feeling stress because of a vulnerability that they're hoping to mask. Exactly right. I think it really helps when dealing with people like that to remember that most, I think most people are basically good and want good things for themselves, for the, at least for themselves and for the people that they care about. And if you can extrapolate that out, you know, even th- there are, there are a few exceptions, but I think almost anyone, if you look at them through the right lens, you can really admire them and finding common ground with people and then also learning where to say no you can't do that um is is helpful that's well said you have the strength of individualization Mm -hmm. i saw you use it as a peer leader on every mba team and i think it's one of the top leadership strengths for the reasons that you just articulated I was so lucky with the teams that I had. Um, I, now the third, the team in the capstone class, I got to I got to influence that to some degree by reaching out to people, and we couldn't choose them, but they could choose us. And so I was allowed to do some. Re- I thought of it as recruiting. <laughs> I imagine so. <laughs> um, but but the first two teams that we ended up on, I, I was just I was just lucky. I was lucky both times. Really lucky both times, and. I wonder how much how much do you think the MBA experience is determined by that? Because I feel like I had a great MBA experience. My uh, grades were good, and I I wonder how much of that I just owe to the other people on those teams. Well, it depends, of course. I think you create the culture of each and every team, so it's you plus three or four other peers for mm-hmm. each of those teams. And I think it's the strengths and the sophistication with which all of the students can use those mm-hmm. that determines the quality of the experience. Investing early in self-awareness, mm-hmm. really from orientation, mm-hmm. gives people an appreciation for their strengths. We go there first. And then talking about weaknesses or stress behaviors that may get in their way or the way of other people And by opening that subject, even if someone hasn't learned to operate themselves effectively, you, as someone who can shape the team for the better, you have an open door to have that type of conversation around strengths and and vulnerabilities. I have this I have this desire to understand people, um, to get to know people and understand what makes them who they are. Why do they do the things they do? And I think most of the time that's an asset. Occasionally, I can get caught in the weeds of understanding who a person is and sort of forget the context in which we're working together. But I think most of the time it's an asset. What are so so sometimes faculty members and administrators will spot things about students that they don't know about themselves to what you were talking about a moment ago, what are the most common weaknesses that you help make business students aware of? That's a great question. Our students, by and large, are lower on relationship building strengths than they are on executing and strategic thinking Mm -hmm. strengths. I think turning attention to that with some data allows students to step up when there is a conflict, to uncover the other person's point of view, to practice building those people strengths that matter so much. Leadership, we we talk about leadership, it's learning to find your success in making others successful. So others are the subject matter or the raw material, and relationship building strengths have to rise in your deck by investing experience with those innate talents that everyone has to one degree or another. There was there was a moment, and I'm going to name names here. I, I was on a team with Emily Klein mm. two years ago, and Emily was such a great idea person. We would be sitting around the table and, and she would say, what if we did this? And we would say, 
that's it. That's it right there. And then we would be walking down the road. We would get to two and a half hours later or two and a half days later or two and a half weeks later. And we would be putting the finishing touches on things. And Emily, whom I love and cherish, would say, what if we did that? (laughs) And I would say, that's a wonderful idea. Let's circle back to the wonderful idea you had two weeks ago and put the finishing touches on that so we can present it in half an hour. That's a great story. That's very Emily. Mm -hmm. You also had a team with Arco and Tan, Mm -hmm. who operated very differently in terms of when they were at their most creative. Mm -hmm. So one more structured and disciplined and predictable, Mm -hmm. less a fan of surprises, True. very effective with that process. And the other liking to work under pressure, to having lots of ideas and energy and bringing a certain spark. I think you taught me the phrase steady versus streaky oh. in relation to those two students on that team. It definitely, it definitely applies. Tan is like, like, a, like a battleship driver. And Arco is a surfer and when it comes to doing business school things. So we talked a little bit about weaknesses. What about the most common strengths that people are not already aware of? What do people tend to overlook in themselves? Another excellent question. What they tend to overlook is typically what their top strengths are because those strengths come so naturally to them and they've practiced them so long to such a degree of skill that it's like breathing. And they take for granted that other people don't have those relatively to the same degree. I think that's the most accurate answer to your question. I think for those strengths that are high for MBAs, uh, results orientation, Mm -hmm. the ability to work very hard and very smart toward a goal to tell relevant from irrelevant, to maximize potential, look at the challenges and opportunities, move forward without overthinking to, to lead others, to simplifying the complexity of, of reality. Doing the, and sometimes doing the common uncommonly well. Yes. Virtuosity. Um, was it, what are the tools, metrics that you use to help students discover themselves as leaders? We have a number of assessments used at different points in the program. The ones that I work directly with are StrengthsQuest, the Berkman assessment, and our own Peer 180, which is like the peer level of a 360. Our full-time students aren't working during the program, So they don't gather upstream, downstream feedback, but they do get feedback from their peers. Mm -hmm. We have the Neris, which is a Myers-Briggs with more story and an avatar attached to your type. Our career center uses that, and we have integrated that more fully into the program. I think those are all of the assessments. Is there another assessment? Oh, career leader. Yes. How could I forget? Career leader, an excellent assessment gives you data on your culture match. Mm -hmm. So do you have a high or low match for collaboration and consideration culture versus precision and planning or extroversion and decisiveness? Gives you good data about your skills, motivators, interests. We do a Nodell values sort. Our students do several things on the career side, and we're able to look at the convergence of the various assessments, or each student is able to do that for himself or herself. I think that takes away over attaching to one instrument, which tends to take the fullness out of someone's expression of, of behavior. That makes sense. Career leader nailed uh, career leader nailed me uh, to the point that I have I still have the page with the rankings and the numbers next to them, and I still keep it in my in my folder. What was your biggest right aha from that? My biggest aha from career leader was I think admitting to myself that I didn't care about the things that were lower on lower on the list one of them was the job I do I want the job I do to 
to provide a big benefit to society, I think. And as it turns out, I like doing that. I like to apply. I like to add benefit to society in other ways. It doesn't have to come through work. And in a way, what we're doing here is sort of a job, but in another way, it's not. It, it doesn't feel like something I have to do. It feels like something I want to do. And hopefully everyone in the room feels the same way. Um, it's the idea is that we can do this new special thing and it doesn't feel like work. There are times, there are moments when it feels like work, but uh, for the most part, it's it's the opportunity to establish this really cool legacy for Mays and for each other. Um, well said. So did you do career leader yourself back in the day? I have not taken career leader. I would like to. I think I could still take it without warping the assessment. I've worked with so many assessments that I understand sometimes what questions are probing for, mm -hmm. but I have not taken it myself. Our students get a great deal of value from it. We use a word with our students called ikigai, the Japanese word. It means a, a clear purpose for your life, mm -hmm. a calling to be yourself in the world. I remember this. Remember this. And it's the overlap between what you're good at and what you enjoy doing, what you're called to do with what the world needs done and what the world will compensate you for. So talking about finding joy in your job, joy and job being one letter different, it's still remarkably hard to seek out that employment that you'll be excited to get up in the morning and go do. I have an insight on that. So my dad, Steve Wiggins, is a professor of economics here. And his last lecture in his 202 class, and I think maybe in his 425 class as well, what 202 is now taught online, but when he was teaching it in person, his last lecture every semester would be about career selection. It wasn't anything to do with economics. It was about career selection and it was optional, but it was always the most attended lecture that he had. And people would invite their friends from not in the class and anyone was welcome to attend and people would bring in friends to hear this lecture because it, it there was apparently it had a reputation a good reputation and so the he would talk about these four circles and they were mostly the same as what you say the one thing that he said that was a little bit different it was a little bit different twist was the question that he would ask last was how well does this job, this vocation fit into the rest of a life that I would want? And I think that's one that people often overlook in terms of, you know, what are the work hours going to be like? Am I going to have to travel a fair bit? Do I want to travel a fair bit? What's my family situation? Would do I, what will be my family situation later on? Do What's the culture like at the place where I'm going to work? And to me, that's where career leader was so great in terms of establishing how well does this fit into the person that I want to be? Yes, does that make sense? Th that's an excellent answer. There's a spectrum. It's an oversimplification. But are you a work to live mm -hmm. person or a live to work person? Mm -hmm. Understanding your work orientation and then all of your other values. True North, which you remember. Mm -hmm reading in Dr. Wesson's class and focusing on with some reflections talks a lot about integrated work-life balance. And I think that with Career Leader, with the reflections throughout the program, brings each student back to that question over and over. It's not something that you can answer one time in one sitting about what's most important and then checking with your family regarding moving or hours that demands outside of regular work hours. Compensation is valued to different degrees. Our students sometimes are surprised to see financial gain or high earnings potential as their top value. So being able to own that, but in a positive way, that's your metric for the success in your career, in your job. But then what you do after you build that wealth, what you do with it, is a completely different set of decisions. It's power and freedom and ability to invest and make a difference. I love the fact that Career Leader established at least two and maybe more, but at least two different financial metrics. It was both 
I have the opportunity to earn a significant amount of money. And then also I think financial stability was the other one focused on upside and downside. And that's a dichotomy that I'm very familiar with having worked in the entertainment business. The upside as an actor, for example, is tremendous. You can make $20 million a picture and that's, those are the actors that everybody knows about. You can also make negative money by investing a tremendous amount in an acting career and never booking anything, anything ever. Literally, I've seen this. I, I knew people who were that. Yeah. And uh, good people, smart people even. And there's a particular kind of talent that it, it's, it's almost like athletic ability, the ability to act. I, I knew really smart people who were bad on camera, bad. And so... Uh, and I don't know if I would have been particularly good in that particular way on camera. The idea of acting in a sitcom, I don't know if I would have been good at that. Well, and know. so much of acting is constrained by the genre and the formulaic aspects of the genre. Sure. Rare, I think, for actors is the opportunity to truly transform a role and make it your own in a powerful, unique way risk reward trade-off in acting (laughs) very difficult yeah it certainly is bringing us back to the personality assessments some people feel like some people feel like they add less than other things do to the business school mix what do you say to people who are skeptical of the value of these tools that's a great question i i don't get that question often anymore when we first began working with assessments and creating part of our students' journey around self-discovery, self-awareness, self-regulation, and then understanding others using the assessments, students would push back through body language, through questions, bomb throwers with questions. A lot of times people who have people who have analytical high in Uh, their strength, the shadow side is prove it. Right. Why, why, why prove it? Yeah. And the need to talk about the validity, the evidence-based nature of the assessment, the test-retest validity, that was sometimes necessary, but very easily done with a link ahead of time. So you can go read about the background of the assessment. I tell students that an assessment is only as true or valuable as it resonates for them, Mm. and also that we have multiple assessments. So if they feel more comfortable speaking the language of one over another, that they should feel free to to choose or prefer. Most students, if they take them and their peers are also taking them and finding validity, will accept and then be excited and talk about overcoming their skepticism. I thought this might be a horoscope initially, doing some humor (laughs) around that, and then it really nailed me. And here's how. Interesting. I remembered a question that I wanted to ask about uh, work-life balance earlier. Do you think we do a better or worse job with work-life balance than we did 25 years ago, 20 years ago? As a culture? Yes. As America, the U.S. specifically. That's another great question. There's some research dialogue now around work-life balance being a myth It's really about strategic choices. Tell me more. I think to your point earlier about the needs of your family, those out-of-work must-haves that you need, uh, considering that in light of your work choices, we are all at any given time, I'm making a choice to be here with you now instead of being home with my family. You you also were making that choice. Mm -hmm. On a different day, we might not come to work or spend less time at work because we're attending to the needs of our family. So at any given time, if we go for three months on the road working and seeing family only through Skype, we've made that choice. The the idea of being in balance, the word balance is a misnomer because it makes you think that things should always be in balance Mm -hmm. and that if you're not balancing X amount of family time versus X amount of work time, that somehow there's a problem that needs to be solved. So do you think it it sounds like what you're saying is partly with the aid of technology, 
we're able to establish parameters on our lives in many more ways than we used to be able to. And do you think that people have used that? If I, I think, I'm going to spoil the ending for you, I think we've done a good job of that as a society, uh, of not defining ourselves by an 8 to 5 or 8 to 6 or 8 to 10 workday like we used to. Yes. I think so. I think of those to whom much is given is much expected and the degrees of freedom and the paradox of choice that comes with that work also spills over those fences prior that kept people on the home front with family time. Saturdays and Sundays were not times when you would be turning your attention to work-related email. I think learning how to manage that freedom to work whenever, wherever, however, is something that requires a lot of thought and maturity and learning about sacrificing. We talk about servant leadership, but to have a family, they they really must come first once you sign on the dotted line of that birth certificate mm-hmm. that really is your primary responsibility over over i mean to balance them of course financial security being an important part of preparing for kids and life success how has parenthood changed your professional approach i would be hard pressed let me let me try to answer that i cannot remember a time when i wasn't a parent so my boys are 19 now. Mm-hmm. My memory goes back before that time, but it's <laughs> so not fresh before that time. Mm-hmm. I think that you learn patience and understanding and that change and growth are possible in a very direct way when you become a parent. It helps you be responsible and resilient and to realize that you are there to make someone else successful, that your success really comes from setting the conditions where your children can grow and flourish and become successful. You learn quickly as well that perfection is not possible. I'm not sure if I'm really a perpetually recovering perfectionist, but I think there may be some people in my life who would have described me that way at one point in time. And you see your kids falling short, the idea of learning through failure becomes very real when you become a parent. Is that more challenging for you now that you are having to watch someone else do it? Well, you are, you, I, everyone, we are all doing that ourselves, but is having to sometimes sit there and let it happen, is that harder than dealing with your own failures? Yes. For me, yes. When it comes to parenting, you want so much to protect or save your children from stumbling when you see the obstacle coming that it's hard to listen to that good advice that they have to make their own way or try and fail. With MBA students, it's not so hard. I can sometimes see the problem coming and then watch it come and then watch the learning in the aftermath. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I, I'm sure it's probably easy for a lot of people if they're not dealing with their own children or as as to see as Victor Levin would describe it. Hi, Vic, if you're listening to this, the bus coming down Main Street. <laughs> yes. But how have the results of the inventories changed during the time that you've been giving the inventories? How is it? What's it like dealing with these gosh dang millennials? Yeah. So you're asking if I see trends or changes. Yes, yes. So we have been working with strengths for 10 years. Berkman, I have been working deeply for four years. My colleague, Mike Wesson, has been doing Berkman's back 14, 15 years. Mm -hmm. I think he would say that today's MBAs are more people-oriented than task-oriented. Okay. More subjective than objective more about getting things done through people and feelings should come to the table Mm -hmm. than it's about widgets and metrics and only logic. So overcoming the stereotype that you mentioned earlier where MBAs tend to be less that way, perhaps. Correct, correct. But it means that MBAs really need to have their work environment care about them as Uh. well. They may or may not bring behaviors that explicitly care about others. They may be still 
acting widget-like on one side while hoping that others treat them with care and consideration of their own feelings and needs, realizing that allows them to correct quickly because they know how they would like to be treated and they can then accept that others have that need. Perspective taking is not something that comes naturally or quickly to every MBA. Sometimes it is more a learned practice, secondary behavior. Can you share some examples of students? You can include names or leave them out that have experienced significant transformations in this area? I really can. I've had so many. They speak so well in their own words. And I read about 2,000 reflections a year, those short reflections that, that we do, mm-hmm. and the leadership portfolio and the look back paper. I have them come into my office and share aha moments from time to time. I had a takeaway recently, and I'll just read it for you. Please. This, this fellow said, my biggest issue is when I'm stressed, I tend to shut down emotionally and physically. I realize this gets in my way with my team members and confuses them. Staying positive and engaging the group at all times are areas I need to work on. I've told my group about this, so hopefully if they feel I'm not being as outgoing and positive as they need me to be, they will let me know. This was a student who had positivity lower third of his strengths deck, very much a thinker and under stress could get anxious and focused on the worst possibilities. And he tended to express those thoughts and feelings when they were negative, not realizing that others were hearing them and overinterpreting them or losing energy because of them. He has now transformed and brings that positive spirit, maybe almost like a, a friend on his shoulder since it's not coming directly from within. So he channels that as a leader now. If zero is understanding nothing about emotional intelligence at all and 100 is the state where we can tabulate and quantify all aspects of it how much progress do you think human society has made relative to the progress we can still make that's probably a question designed to detect how high positivity is in someone's deck Uh oh it's a good question thought of that but i wonder for me emotional intelligence is higher on the local than it is on the global. So we have that saying, all politics is local. We understand the person in the next office or the person down the street, the person in our community whose need we can directly perceive. And I think our emotional intelligence, therefore, is influenced by the people in our community. I think now that the world is flat and technology, as you said, is such a part of how we do business, we have to understand people in other cultures with very different backgrounds. And doing that is overwhelming. So socially speaking, I think we are going through a cycle now of withdrawing and being somewhat fearful of being overwhelmed by a larger confusing world when economic opportunities are seen to be less available by many. I think, however, that we have the ability to sense immediately that even when we are across a political divide, we agree on about 85% of most local topics. I'll just put myself right in the middle on that one. I think we have a long way to go. Let me say that as well. That makes sense. So tell us a little bit about how these assessments work. What are the What are the strengths of each? What, no pun intended, um, are there any weaknesses? And what, what, what pushes you to one rather than another? Tell us, tell us about Berkman's strengths. That's a a great question. So Myers Briggs, which is Neris, which we use from the career side, Mm. and strengths are two of the four market leaders. Our students meet those a lot in industry Mm -hmm. and on internship. I think using those allows them to speak a self-awareness language that they can then find in the world and use with employees. I think HR departments also are happy when our students come to interviews and can talk about something that the company uses or recognizes. So that's a good reason for using strengths and Mm NARIS. 
Berkman is not the market leader, but it is probably the best for understanding yourself, understanding others, and then managing for optimal performance in the workplace. The gold standard, it's referred to sometimes as the gold standard for self-assessments. What makes Berkman so powerful is that you discover not only your usual style, your strengths, and then your weaknesses, mm. but you, un- you understand the root causes for stress behaviors, weaknesses also uh, identified by others as unwelcome negative behaviors that you exhibit when you're under stress. Mm. But we don't pause often to think about why we're stressing out and how we might not bring our stress behavior to work. Berkman identifies the unmet need, which you are not meeting. So we stress out in order to get what we need, but we do it in an unproductive way. I'll give you an example with with me. So on the social energy component, that's one thing that Berkman measures. In my usual style, I'm friendly, talkative, outgoing, I enjoy people. But in order to bring that usual style, I need a lot of time alone or in small groups. So I'm a 92 on social energy usual style, but a 17 for my preferred environment. Mm. So in order to bring the social outgoingness, I have to have a lot of time alone. If I don't get my alone time, I become mean and nasty, which is the opposite of nice and friendly, which surprises (laughs) people, right? (laughs) But when I become mean and nasty, people leave me alone, which is what I need. But I've gotten it in a very unproductive way that messes with my brand. We tell our students that our brand is what people say about us when we're not in the room. You want to have a positive impression on people. Wow. Not bring your stress behavior and have them over remember because they will over remember stress behaviors ten times more than regular behavior. So when you're talking about the drivers of those stress behaviors, at when you dig even a little farther down, do you have these conversations with students in terms of like do students say things like I'm driven by fear of failure, fear of confinement, fear of loss of community, those sorts of things like how how deep does this go? It goes deep. We have these conversations typically as a trio. Mm. So students will pair up with a classmate. They have the ability to choose that classmate. And we will have each student bring some burning questions to the table once they've reviewed their results. Mm. And from there, I, I will have prepared by looking at everyone's results or looking at those two individuals' results and identifying the components where they have extremity, like I just described for my social energy. Mm -hmm. So if someone has extremity on the authority component or the assertiveness component, sometimes people will be large and in charge and pick up the megaphone and give orders in their usual style. And because it is usual and strong, people welcome it. But on the flip side, if someone treats them in the same way, they may become very stressed and argumentative and domineering in an unwelcome way. So think the, the, the bad boss, the person who starts yelling. They may not realize that they need other people to approach them more deferentially or suggestively, and that the absence of that causes them to really act nasty and piss other people off when, in fact, they want to do exactly the opposite. I find the most effective leaders, leadership style is walk softly, carry a giant stick, and never use it, ever, ever. But I like that. <laughs> so you must, however, be perceived, I think, as willing to use it when necessary to defend certain values, interests, principles. Exactly. I don't right. know what using it would look like. I'm, I'm picturing someone paddling me in sixth grade, you know, when it was still legal. <laughs> right. I was never involved in any sort of confrontation in business school. But as you said, the willingness to, it's really something kind of primal the idea that we are gentle people, but if pressed far enough, we will die or kill. Mm. to protect what we care for, to protect those we care about. And you don't have to 
you don't have to let people see very much of that for them to understand that you're a person not to be trifled with. And if you are strong, you don't have to say you're strong. Yes. I think one thing also, I think this is something that you are able to do with your teams. People will follow you or align with you as long as they know you know you're not perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that gives you strength. Almost paradoxically, it gives you strength because you've shown vulnerability, but in a very secure way. Mm. You're not putting your emotional needs on other people. You're just demonstrating to them ways in which you fall short and try to improve. They can relate to that. And so trust is established and reinforced. I think trust is the foundation of leadership. You, you also, on your teams, as well as leaders do in general, make people feel safe around you. You're not going to let the cart go into the ditch. You're not going to let one loud voice over talk some quieter thinkers on the team mm -hmm. or redefine reality by taking the team off track and committing to their opinion because their way is the best way. You will bring it back as long as it takes for everyone to move forward together with a smile on the outside, at least. You, you talked about trust and, and trust, I think, is the is the bedrock of leadership and respect respect has to be earned and it is best earned by immediately offering respect to others and the leadership is full of paradoxes in in to what you were saying earlier i think the best leaders are really about service and this is the economist in me I think groups function most effectively when everyone believes that the incentives of the other people in the group are aligned with their own incentives. And if they believe that you're trying to make that happen as a leader, they will run through walls for you. And you have to make it clear that you will conversely run through walls for them. Yes. So, and if you're willing to do those things and you really are looking out for the interests of the people around you, the sky really is the limit. You're absolutely right. We use several trust frameworks in the program, but one comes from the thin book of trust. Hmm. We talk about sincerity and reliability. So say what you mean and then do what you say you will do, words and deeds. And then competence, not overclaiming your ability to do something. And or care. Or, yes, sir, or requiring someone else to do something that they're not able to do and then mm. holding them accountable for it. And then care. And you remember, I can tell from your comment, that care is the most important of the four. You can let people down by being misinterpreted mm. or sometimes spinning a little or dropping a ball or occasionally allowing people to think that you might have a skill that you don't have all the way, right? But as long as they believe that you totally care about their best interest, both on that assignment in that workplace, as well as respect them as a whole person, uh, have their well-being at heart and best interest, then they will definitely follow you. You will have trust on your team and the team will be strong. You, you mentioned getting to know people as whole people. Keith Ferrazzi wrote a book uh, 15 years ago, Never Eat Alone is the title of the book. And he talks about health, wealth, and children. Those are the things, if you, if you don't know what to ask someone about, think about those three things. Ask them about something that relates to their health, nutrition, fitness, if they've dealt with, you know, if they've dealt with a, a health concern in the past and you know them well enough to, yes, to go rem at that. Yes, remember that, yes. Yes, yeah, and you have to be, navigate those things carefully, obviously, and then wealth, and then their kids, if they have kids. Mm -hmm. I think. That's a great thing to point out as well. It's not so much whether you care, but how you show you care. And many of our students will adopt a habit like you just described of having a short list mm. of topics right. they can use when they don't get to see someone frequently. Leaders' time is really in short supply mm. and they don't get around to all of their direct reports or the people the level below. So asking about something that's safe or something that's important in a personal way if they know the person well. So hometown, weekend, vacation, sports, if you know the person likes sports. Our students actually will make little mnemonics 
for that. People are ends in and of themselves. Don't be the networking jerk, prospective students. Our program's brand depends on it. Right. No kidding. So let's move to some rapid fire questions. Oh, fun. My favorite. Can I just say that Keith Ferrazzi's book never, I got to eat dinner once with Keith Ferrazzi. Really? I sat directly across from him. He was on Twitter several times during the meal, which I thought was interesting. I'm not surprised. I imagine he has very high restlessness, usual style. I respect that now that I understand Berkman. But for introverts like me, we like to eat alone about three quarters of the time. The other quarter of the time, we like to join you, but it drains us of energy. Yes. There were a lot of really... I would say borderline profound uh, truths in that book for me. Um, I didn't necessarily agree with the title either. And I am, I I love to eat with other people, but. uh, Yes, rapid fire. So introverts, I've tried to get ready for rapid fire. Okay. So, and by the way, we can, we can start over. We can stop and go. What do you consider your most valuable failure? So this is going to be an answer you don't get often. I have two severely developmentally disabled twin boys. They are not a failure in the typical sense of the word, but because I did not give birth to them in a way that made them safe and whole health-wise, I I feel like that is my failing or an area in which I fell short. I'm not sure the cosmos sees it that way, but I have learned a lot from that experience, and it has taught me to sacrifice and to find joy in very uncommon, unexpected places as I have watched them grow and cope and learn. They are happy and emotionally sound. Therefore, I am, I am now healed from that. That is so honest. Thank you for sharing that. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? Possibly that I have more energy than I do. Oh. And I don't think anyone in this room has that misconception. But as I said, I can show up energetic, both physically and socially. You come off as tireless. You do. That is a good word. Now that you say that, people have told me that before, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. But that has been one of my big lessons. So I will push myself like achievers. Many of our students are achievers. I will I will skip meals and continue to work and not let go of the task to a point where I will start to physically shut down or my mood will take me out. And so I've learned to catch myself and not burn the candle too hard. Mm -hmm. And when I say tireless, I don't necessarily mean in terms of like Mm. all the time. I don't know if we can keep a sound like that, but uh, but just in terms like you were saying of just continuing to grind away at the not not grind in a bad way necessarily sure. but just to keep doing it until it's done well and that is my brand i think i will continue to work i really like to work hard for a goal i believe in with other people who are passionate about that and it doesn't matter so much the specific context or industry or job to take rockefeller Mm -hmm. Rockefeller is about improving the health and well-being of people around the world. They do global environment and agricultural engineering, lots of different programs, public health, but they are about making the world better than they found it. And that is what motivates me. I I love to work hard. So I'm glad I I am known as tireless. And this is the Rockefeller Foundation you were just describing, which is where you worked while you were doing your PhD. Correct. Correct. We can talk about that a little bit more offline, but back to the rapid fire Back to the non-rapid, rapid fire. (laughs) No, no, this is great. If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? That's easy. Susan Cain, whose research led to her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. When I read that book, I felt like I had seen myself in a totally new way. I was much more accepting of myself after reading that book. And she has talked with so many introverts about how they operate themselves for high performance that I would like to learn more from her. I'm going to cheat a little bit. What was the best piece of advice that you got from that book other than appreciate yourself as an introvert? 
understanding that introversion is not we we tend to favor extroversion now in the 21st century mm -hmm. we like to see people who have a bias for action and are decisive and outgoing and make an impact influential people i understand that and not being one of those people i had come to see the word introvert as negative or putting you at a lesser place somehow and that helped me understand that introverts need zones of less stimulation mm. in order to have energy. Life, life drains us out more. Life, the typical going and doing and, and moving and hearing microphones and that sort of thing, and we have to put it back. But we do some of the world's best thinking. So understanding how much better I did that than some other people and how I could then add value through my strengths. I read somewhere once that the difference between introverts and extrovert introverts and extroverts from um from a biochemical standpoint is that extroverts have a slight shortage of dopamine in their brains and so extroverts tend to look for extroverts and I'm I'm one tend to look for those little dopamine jolts more often than introverts do. Introverts have, on par, more sufficient levels of dopamine on their own. And so when they get the too many of the dopamine jol jolts, it's actually overwhelming. Yes, I believe that. That makes a lot of sense. Even the environment for me the doctor has checked my reflexes and one doctor checked them once and my leg, of course, kicked way out. And he mm. said, I've never seen such hyperactive reflexes. I go. want to measure you for all these other things. And I said, well, I think that's just me. I just overreact. My parents tell me that I've done that from birth. You can tell with babies as well. So babies who seem to be comfortable in their own skin uh, often will be the extroverts, mm. right? and babies who are um, having trouble processing the world. So noises, light, sound, changes in their rhythm, they will need an environment of more controlled stimulation. They have a picture of me, my parents, in my crib, and I had one of those mobiles. Mobiles have gotten a lot more lights and sounds now, but it was just birds, stuffed birds that went around like this, and I took them all down. As soon as I could pull up and reach for them, I took them all down and I threw them out of the crib. And so they have a picture of me standing there in a, against a bare wall with a crib that had very little adornment with just this place where the mobile had hung over the bed. And they talked to me about how I behaved with that mobile. And then did you look at that spot? Like, what were you were you looking at anything or were, were you just inside your own mind? So I don't remember. <laughs> I have to say that's in the rearview mirror more than half a century now. They thought it was something they didn't expect me to do. I can imagine. And so they have remembered it and told me that story. But Fair I enough. realize now that I like quiet and when someone interrupts me or I hear a sudden noise, even the microwave. So my husband and I, you know, spouses, we have humor in the home. So my, my husband turns the thermostat down and I turn it up. And he'll leave the timer. I'm on your side, by the way. Oh, good. I wouldn't have expected that. My husband will let a sound go on. So his phone is always pinging and he'll put the timer on and he just won't turn it off and he won't be hearing it. And I'll be in the other room working and I feel like I'm being boiled in oil just from that one sound. It's, a, it's my problem to solve. I realize that. I try not to stress out because of it. It's hard. Problem solving. The answer is to go pick his phone up and Fling it through the window. <laughs> I'm sure that would have an excellent result. <laughs> right. What is your fondest memory here at Texas A&M? I believe it's hard to choose one. I remember volunteering to be a victim at Disaster City for our students when they did a rotation there. Not all of our classes do that. Some years, yes. Some years, no. That is a place where first responders are trained in very stressful environments. Mm -hmm. And I was the victim in a parking garage collapse. So I was made up to look wounded mm -hmm. and put into a broken down car and strapped in at an awkward angle. And I had to be rescued perpetually. So I did this eight times in a row. They were supposed to come and get me and shift me to other disaster scenes uh -huh. so that I could experience more. 
but they forgot about me. I can be somewhat forgettable being introverted and quiet. And the upside of that was that I got to see teams do the rescue exactly under the same conditions. So which teams were relatively more skillful versus less. So I think the debriefs were more meaningful. But I loved seeing my students in a different way. So instead of being on the outside, looking at them, solve the problem or judging them in any way or reading their reflection, I was actually, you know, an element in the problem situation that they had to solve. Being an introvert, I'm not going to be a paramedic or a firefighter. So I got to vicariously be part of that excitement. Method acting. We, that sounds, that sounds like it would be really interesting. Have you ever done uh, Dr. Wesson's layoff exercise? I have. I did. What was, what was that like? It was, as it is for many students, surprisingly more stressful in the moment than you expect it to be going in. You're well prepared by Dr. Wesson, mm-hmm. but when you're actually across the table from someone who's very good at playing the role of the person being laid off, he selects the layees very well. Mm. They're often seasoned HR professionals who do this for a living and live in the trenches. Those folks are trying to put you off your game, not in mean ways or malicious ways, but in ways that will stretch your comfort zone and test your ability to adapt and adjust. The biggest mistake I made, and he told us not to make it on the way in, and I made it anyway, and I knew I was making it as I was making it, was I looked at my watch because we we were held to timing. I think we had to start and end within a 20-minute period, Mm -hmm. and there was no clock in the room. Right. So we were, I guess, going to use our watch and look at it without seeing it. We didn't have phones quite as much. My cell phone was a flip phone at that time, and I had to look down at my watch, which was actually too big because I borrowed my husband's watch because I didn't have my own watch. And I, I saw the person take a note, looked at watch. While I was looking at my watch. Uh, while you're laying them off. Yes. So we usually close the discussion with some good bull for our listeners. This is an opportunity to recognize someone else for something good or great that they have done. Do you have anyone you would like to send some good bull? There could be so many choices. Let me offer this good bull to you for allowing us to do these podcasts. I know it's been a team effort with Shannon, and there's not enough good bull that we could pile up, I think, to appreciate Shannon's leadership of our program. But alums are busy people and newly married, lots going on. I get the extrovert thing, but there's still limits to human capacity. No question. And you use your individualization strength so beautifully You have prepared me. I know you have an understanding of me and what puts me at my best. So I appreciated the call to talk ahead of time about what we might cover. I think this will allow us to tell stories that have been largely untold to this point about our program. So thanks for your leadership on that. Thanks. That's that's very kind of you. So anyway, thank you, Dr. Mark Antonio, for uh, for joining us this Wednesday evening and. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. We, we would not be here without you guys. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to listen to us. You are welcome to check in with us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We're always happy to have a rating. If it can be five stars, we certainly appreciate <laughs> that. But we also appreciate feedback. And be kind. Thank you for watching. We appreciate your support. Drop us a like below and feel free to leave a comment if you wish. We appreciate positivity and constructive feedback. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on our latest episodes and bonus content. You can also take us on the road using your favorite podcast listening app. We have those linked below. If you'd like to know more about Mays Business School or our guests, visit mays.tamu.edu forward slash podcasts. Talk with you soon.